The last thing that we looked at was a non-leaf procedure which actually calls another procedure which is itself, but it doesn't really matter. If this was a call to procedure will or procedure 14, it wouldn't matter. It's a procedure calling another procedure. That's the mo most important point. It happens to be a famous factorial program which is recursive, but that's not the point we're trying to illustrate. Okay. So what do we expect to have to do when a procedure calls another procedure? We expect to have to store anything which is important on the stack before the call and then restore those things after the call. So here we go. Fact, search for the JAL. There it is. It calls some other procedure. calls itself, in fact. And soon after that, um, I'd like you to notice that it loads from stack two things. And those two things were pushed onto stack at the beginning. So we can say it pushed two things or saved two things on stack, made the call to another procedure, this one in fact, but it doesn't matter, and then restored them after the call. That's what we expect to find for non-leaf procedures. Now, what did it push onto the stack? The answer is it pushed the return address register because this line of code will change it, and it pushed the argument register because this line of code will change it. After the return, it popped them both off and now they're the same as they were at the beginning. So that when we get to this or we get to this, we're using the original values which were given to us here. Is that clear to everybody? The object of non-leaf procedures is to save on the stack anything which is going to be changed and you need to have it unchanged if it's not already guaranteed like an S register. All right? That's the, I'll say it again really close. What's the object of a non-leaf procedure? It knows it's going to call somebody else in doing its duties, right? You could say, to what, what does fact do? And the answer is, this is just push stuff on the stack, and this is just get stuff off the stack. So what it does is, those lines, including this and this mull. And then it finishes and goes home, right? So it does that stuff and this and calls fact to help it do its work and it does a multiplication. But this part here, where we do manipulation with the stack and changing the stack pointer, these three and these three are not the actions of this non-leaf procedure. They're, what shall I say, the self-preservation and housekeeping. They don't actually help it to compute factorial. They just make sure that the data that's important doesn't get bozed up in the actions. Got that? Six lines of overhead because it's a non-leaf procedure. If it was a leaf procedure, then nobody would be called and we wouldn't have to worry about changing A0 and therefore wouldn't have to preserve it. Wouldn't have to worry about changing uh, uh, <coughs> the return address and wouldn't have to save it. That would save us these six lines and these six lines because all this does is, as you see here, change the stack pointer to make room for two new things and push them on. And all this does is pop them off and then change the stack pointer to get rid of the two extra locations. Six lines of code in order to safely put things on the stack and then when we know that they won't be damaged anymore, safely pull them back off the stack. Okay, So that's housekeeping. That's overhead associated with a non-leaf procedure. Now, let's look at the, at the actual activity. Just to remind us, what is this supposed to do? If n is less than 1, return 1 as the factorial value. Otherwise, return the value of n multiplied by the factorial of 1 smaller. OK, so that's what we're supposed to do. So we first save ra and a0 on the stack. Why? Why not save the temporaries? Why not save the global pointers? What's the answer to that question? Because we're going to change in here. Only save things that need to be preserved from danger. Where's the danger to RA? Right here. JAL changes RA. Where's the danger to A0? Find me a line that changes A0. There's one right there. Do this and it changes A0. So therefore, if there's a, so a line that changes that something, you've got to preserve it. So we push three, two things on the stack and then what do we do? We do a test to see if A0 is less than 1. If it's less than 1, what am I supposed to do? If A0 is less than 1, I'm supposed to put 1 in the V0 register and be done. Let's see if we do that. If it is less than, and this becomes a 1, 
which means it's not equal to 0, and we don't branch, it means we do this, which is what? Put 1 in the v0 register, put my stack pointer back where it was, and go home. We're done. That's the base case. It's this one right here. Is everybody OK with that? Want to look at it again? Let's look at it again. After you push some things on the stack and change the stack pointer, you can't leave it changed. So right before you go home, you have to unchange it. This says decrease it by 8. This says increase it by 8. So you put the stack pointer back where it was. And the two things that you pushed were unnecessary. How do you know they were unnecessary? Because we didn't go here where we changed them. We stayed here where we don't change them. So we didn't really need to push them. But we do have to fix the stack pointer. So what's the actual thing we do? We put 1 added to 0 into the v0 register. So understand, we put 1 in the v0 register. Why the v0 register? It's the return register. It's where you put the rate output parameter. And then we say, go home. Why? The control came back to you, Mr. Caller. And guess what? Here I brought a value for you in v0 too, just like you asked me to. I did your job of factorial, OK? That's fine. That's the base case. What happens if we don't pass this test? We branch to L1, which is going to be the implementation of this code, the else. Else do what? Multiply n by the value you get when you call factorial with n minus 1. So that means I first have to call factorial with n minus 1, get that value, then multiply it by the n, and then I return that value. OK, let's see how that works. OK, everybody see this multiply? It multiplies a0, which is your original value of n, which you just finished restoring from the stack because you knew you didn't want to get it damaged here. So you wisely pushed it here. And then after you damaged A0, you said, but I'm smart. I'm going to bring it back. So now here's the original value of n multiplied by the value in V0, which happens to be what you got when fact returned. So it's the factorial of n minus 1. It comes to you in v0. There it is. You restored the a0 value. There it is. So that's n times factorial of n minus 1. Multiply them together. Put the result in v0 and return with it. Ah. It's doing what it's supposed to do. It multiplies n by factorial of n minus 1. How do I know that's factorial of n minus 1? Because that's what I get from here. It's the return value. How do I know it's of n minus 1? Because that's what I gave it as its input parameter before I called it. Does everyone see that when you call JAL, it's going to expect its arguments in the A registers? Buiren, there it is. It's going to give its result in the V register, V0. There it is, Buiren. Are we OK? See how that works? OK. So now let's ask, what else does this lower code do? This lower code not only restores the stack pointer like this one also did here, but it says, you know what? The things I pushed on the stack, I need them. And so it pops them back off. The stored value that you pushed for A0 comes back off and goes back into A0. The stored value that you pushed for RA comes back off and goes there. Now what is this, real quick? That says the stack pointer plus 0 is the address that I want you to store onto. What does that say? Stack pointer plus 4 is the address I want you to store onto. What does this say? From stack pointer plus 4, please put it in the register RA. This says from the location of the stack pointer itself, please put it in A0. And this says now change the stack pointer and bring it back up. Forget those two things. You've copied them back to register. We don't need them. They're now junk. They're now invalid. Let's move our stack pointer up and point to the place that it pointed when we came in. So we've moved the stack pointer, but we moved it back. We changed A0, but we restored it back. We changed the return address register, but we had saved it and restored it back. So by the time we leave right here or here, everything's the same except for one thing. When I leave here or I leave here, one thing's different. What's that? V0. V0 has now the value. Here it'll have the value 1. Here it'll have the value of n times fact of n minus 1. Everybody see that? That's the assembly language implementation of this code right there. That's factorial in assembly language. Now that is probably something that's not easy to wrap your head around the first time you see that much assembly code. 
but I'm beginning to expect now that you're not scared of add immediate, jump return, jump and link, load words, store words, set less than with an immediate value, and add with an immediate value. I'm beginning to expect that you understand the syntax now of this programming language a little bit better. We're still doing examples. I'm not going to test you yet, but I'm expecting you to concentrate and ask yourself, do I know why this is this and this is this and this is this? Do I know why this is this? What's the effect of that? What does it mean to load a word? Why is this here and this here? And if you don't have good answers to those questions yourself, come and get them. Come and get them. By email, by telephone, by visiting during office hours, by talking to your friends, by going to the TAs, by looking in the book, by checking the slides, come and get the answers. Don't, don't leave the questions unanswered. Don't leave yourself confused and yara kopmush, okay? That's your responsibility. That's not my responsibility. Your responsibility is to make sure that you understand the key concepts. Now, I've spent a long time on leaf and non-leaf procedures. Does that give a message to you? What's the message that it gives? It's important. That's a very clear message. What's another message that it gives? Going to need it. And it's sort of related. It's important. One more. It's what? See it again, that's again related to it's important and you will need it. Okay, one more. It's not that easy. I spend long times on hard things and short times on easy things. So if I spend a long time on something, that means I understand from past years of teaching students, yeah, razor. You know, it's not that easy. Okay, I think if I took a vote here today, how many of you call this, ah, piece of cake, easy, chokula, ya hoja, ya, ya shakayapma hoja, boy. Yeah, and how many of you think that way? Not too many. How many of you think, <laughs> this is not easy. Maybe most of you are in the middle. It's not going to eat you, but neither is it a piece of cake. Okay? Did I tell you my Tom Cruise piece of cake joke? Oh, all right. I won't tell it again. Okay. <laughs> but that always made a soft spot in my heart for Toprak Sergan ever after that. So whenever he's on TV or a Disney or a movie, uh, I say, Adamam, Kochum. All right. Uh, now. Spilling registers. Okay, everybody knows to spill is tashmak. Okay, to spill registers. When you spill a glass of tea, what happens? Yeah, it was in the tea glass, but now it's not. Now it's on the floor. Okay. What do you think happens when you spill registers? The data was in the registers, but now it's on the floor? No. <laughs> Lost? No. Thank goodness. In memory, exactly. There wasn't enough register space, so we had to spill into memory. Okay? That means we're going to put it in memory with uh, stores and bring it back with loads. Okay? That's, that's exactly what we're talking about. What if the callee needs to use more registers than allocated to argument and return values? Yanni, in MIPS, it's more than four and more than two. Every architecture is going to have some limit, you know, whatever. You give 50 and 20, but there, what, what if it's more? That's the question. And then the answer is, the callee uses a stack, and a stack is a last in, first out queue. And here's a picture of a stack that grows from high address down. So we call this the top of the stack, and if I want to push something on, it's going to go here. And if I want to pop something off, it'll be this thing, and the stack pointer after popping will go this way, and after pushing will go this way. That's the picture that I couldn't draw very well on the board. I'm a terrible artist, but this is a good one. Okay, that's a picture of a stack growing from high memory. So what will the initial stack pointer be when the system boots up and the operating system uh, sets the initial stack pointer? Highest memory address. That's right, it grows down. Okay. All right, now one of the general registers, stack pointer register, which is actually number 29, is used to address the top of the stack. It lets us know where the last thing we pushed in is because it's a last in, first out queue. And so to add, we do pushing, which means what? Change the stack pointer down by four to point to a new location and then write the data at that new location. And to take things out, we remove by doing what's called a pop. And a pop removes data by getting the data from that location and then moving the stack pointer up. Or getting the data from that location and moving it. So it moves up after you get. When you pop, it moves down, and then you put on a push. Is that pretty clear to everybody? Did you have, hopefully, something very much like that in your CS201 course on data structures? Yeah, good. Only maybe then there the stack was the other way, and it was growing up. I mean, stacks either have to grow down or they have to grow up. 
There's a reason why in hardware we grow stacks down. You'll see it very soon. Okay, now let's imagine that we have nested subroutines. So in this case, A calls B, B calls C. So that means A is a non-leaf, B is a non-leaf, C is a leaf. Everybody sees that C just executes and returns. So the code for A says blah, blah, call B, blah, 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 blah. The code for B is blah, blah, call C, blah, 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 return. The code for C is blah, 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 return. Everybody see that? That's C's code, that's B's code, that's A's code. Are we okay on that? All right. Why doesn't A return at the bottom? Why doesn't A return? Look, B returns at the end, C returns at the end. Why doesn't A return at the end? It's the root. Exactly right. So what we have here is main calling B, which is a non-leaf, which calls C, which is a leaf. C returns, and we're back in B from this point on. B returns, and we're back in A from this point on. Does everybody understand that after A runs to here and then calls B, when it returns, we'll continue from this point and keep on going down, which is to the end. When B runs, it runs to this point and calls C, and then after the return, we'll pick up right here after and keep on going until we hit the return. When C is called, it starts here and executes down to the return, and it's finished. Does everybody see that? Okay, so now the flow, I think everybody can tell, is from A, go to B, so now we're here. From B, go to C, so now we're here. From C, finish, and come back to B. From B, finish, and come back to A, and from A, finish. That's the order of execution, okay? So in the middle, right here, we're partway through A, and we stopped and went into B. We're partway through B, we stopped and went into C. We're partway through C, so right here, a is partway, B is partway, and C is partway. <coughs> Executed. But this is not a slide about execution flow, it's a slide about the stack. Let's have a look here. When I'm in A, then the necessary uh, parameters and values that are needed for A are on the stack. And this area is called the stack frame, or activation record, for A. When A calls B, we don't get rid of that. We just push B's activation record or stack frame on top of the stack on top of A's. And when we're in the B environment, the B activation record is get early and active. At this point, we call C, and so we add a third activation record or stack frame, which is C. So right now, A and B and C are all on the stack. But the one at the top of the stack is C because it's the one that's active. If you think about it, in all cases, the one on the top of the stack is the one that's active. Right now, the top of the stack is A because A is active. Right now, the top of the stack is B because B is active. Right now, the top of the stack is C because C is active. Right here, the top of the stack is B because C is finished and is deleted. And so we're back to a stack with just A and B. But B is the top because it's active. And once I return from B, you know what I do? The stack pointer comes back and only A is on the top of the stack. Now this A, of course, is a set of addresses. It's the whole frame. It's all the things that A needs to be doing on the stack. So it's not one location. It's a group of memory locations on the stack which are necessary for A's execution or B's execution or C's execution, okay? Any questions about that? So the stack becomes the place to push the temporary data that's not in register, to push any stored values that are needed for calling and returning, as we have already shown, et cetera, et cetera. There's actually quite a few things that the stack does for us in the execution environment of a procedure or method or subprogram or function or whatever your lovely name for it is. It's called a lot of different things in programming terminology. Any questions about this? Let's keep moving then. If you have them, ask them. If you don't have them, then I'm going to move on. Okay, now, allocating space on the stack. Aside means, you know, yan konu. Um, the segment of the stack, oh, those are also called stack segments. I didn't mention that. The segment of a stack containing a procedure's saved registers and its local values is called procedure frame or sometimes stack frame or activation record, okay? Now look, here's one of them. 
between the frame pointer and the stack pointer. That's one of those ones, A or B or C. Look what's in it. Saved argument registers, if there's any. Saved return address, if you have to. Any local registers that you need to save. Any local arrays and even structures could be big. Okay, these are just a few registers. We talk about arrays and structured data. If it's local, it can get real big. Now, if it's not local, what is it? It's global. If it's global, it's in a different area of memory. But if it's local to you, then it's on your stack. Huh. That means that every time in C and Java, when you've written a local data structure that's not globally accessible to all of your methods, it was stored on the stack of that frame of that procedure or method when it was executing. And when it finished executing, of course, the memory space was freed up and given back. Yeah, yeah. That's why I took my fingers and I wiped off those activation records. When their program section completed, we give back the memory. We don't keep it forever. So the stack grows down as we add and shrinks back up as we don't need. When we finish, we give up that memory space. I'd like everybody to just notice that that's what I'm talking about here. When I'm in C, I gotta still have the A and B things for the future when I go back to them. But when I'm done, I wipe them off. And what I've wiped off, of course, is that. Don't need any more argument registers that are saved for A if I'm not in A. Don't need a saved return address if I'm not in A. Don't need A's local registers or A's local arrays or data structures if I'm not in A. Let them go. Okay. All right. Now, the only other thing to mention here is we're growing this way from high down to low. The stack pointer, as you know, points to the top of the stack, so the place where either the last full or next empty uh, data will be placed. What's this? And I think you can quickly see, aha, uh -huh, that frame pointer points to the beginning of the stack frame, and the stack pointer points to the end of it, and we now understand what it is to talk about an activation record or a procedure frame. It's the memory area between the frame pointer and the stack pointer. Now, if the stack pointer is dynamic because I, I'm having dynamic data changing, this is going to be moving all around. But this one will be stable and solid as long as I'm in the execution environment of this procedure. Therefore, if I need to get to this, which do you think is easier? From a sobit point to come down some fixed number or from a dynamically changing point to go up some dynamically changing number? How am I going to get to the 12th item in this frame? Well, if this is the beginning address, add, not so, sorry, subtract 12 words and go get it. That'll always be the same. But what if it's also the third one up from the top of stack, but this top of stack happens to change as I push new things on? Oh, well, then it was, was third, but did I push three more? Okay, now it's six. That becomes a dynamic calculation. So the purpose of frame pointer is to give you a stable reference point to know where your, your uh, stack frame begins, not where it ends, because where it ends could be dynamically moving. See, so we push things onto stack and pop things off to stack a lot. We've already seen examples of that. Is that helpful? Is that clear? So that's now the last one, frame. No, it didn't the last one. Still global pointer to go. But now we understand what frame pointer is. Got an idea about what it is. And by the way, it's obviously used by the compiler um, as it uh, develops code into assembly language um, to help it manage uh, pushing and popping onto the stack. OK. So here's the idea. Uh, here's a stack frame. Before we open up a new environment, uh, we put what C calls automatic variables uh, or local variables into the stack frame. Uh, in its execution environment, we have these. And when that execution environment closes, we go back to where we were before. But look how we open up a new execution environment. The stack pointer will no longer point to the last or top of stack in this frame. It now points to the last or top of stack in this one. And frame pointer no longer points to the beginning of this frame. It points to the beginning of this frame. Why? Because this is now the active one. This one is still on the stack, but I've added a new environment. And while I'm running in that, this is the one that's sketch early. So I moved both of these to their new locations. When I delete this off the stack, that goes to there, and that goes to there. And I'm back to where I was before. That's essentially, remember we had A, then add B, then add C, then wipe off C, then wipe off B, and we're back to A. That's what we had done before. All right. Um, S this procedure frame, or stack frame, as it says here, is used by some compilers to manage stack storage. Some, not all compilers use the 
idea of frames. Now, this is a very important slide. I've said quite a few things today that I expect you to remember, but this one I expect you to remember for the rest of your career. Long after you've forgotten MIPS and assembly language program. This is a career slide, okay? So, 40 years. Don't forget it. All right, here we go. <laughs> this is an overall memory map of how memory is used for a process in most processors, including this one that we're talking about. There's a reserved area of memory, and obviously the operating system and system code goes there. Then there are three, I guess, four areas of memory which belong to your process, your procedure, your whatever. And what are they? Text, where the code goes. Text is another word for code. So the code goes here. Static data, which doesn't change, which is global and available to everybody, goes here. And then dynamic data, which is often called your heap and can grow as program go. Every time you do a memory allocate or Java, forget what it's called, adds more of that. And stack, which is your local, as you saw, those frames that are local to individual procedures and methods. So stack is growing down. Dynamic heap data is growing up. It, by having two that grow from opposite directions, we're allowed to use this to its fullest extent. Okay? In addition to that, the compiler knows how much static data you have and how much text you have and places those in locations as well. So that's what the memory map looks like for a typical uh, process running in a typical processor. Okay? So lowest location, maximum location, OS takes low memory always, stack usually grows down from high memory, heap grows up, they, they allow, the meeting point here could be low, like this if I have a lot of stack data and not much heap, it could be like this if I have a lot of heap and not much stack. This is the best way to maximally use memory and allow us to avoid overflow. Obviously stack overflow or heap overflow means that I, I've run out of space here. And the static data and text areas are managed typically like this. Code goes first on top of OS, then comes static data, then comes the dynamic. Okay? That's a typical memory map. Now you notice for MIPS, there's even special addresses that are assigned for this. Okay? Even special addresses are given for that boundary right there, that boundary right there, the starting a value for our global pointer. Hey, our last final missing friend. What does the global pointer do? It points to a location in the middle of the static data so that you can, with an offset, get to this or get to that most easily. Obviously, if you put it here, then the global pointer can point in that direction, but not as far as if you put it here. Now it can point that much more that way or that much more that way. If you put it here, it's no use because global pointer points to global data. And this is code. I mean, the PC points to code. The PC says where to fetch the next instruction. So your instructions are here. You're going to fetch those out when you increment the PC and fetch the next instruction. This is data, and we need to be able to get to it. I know how to get to my stack data. That's not hard. I've got a stack pointer that'll help me get to that. My dynamic data and my static data are referenceable via this global pointer or pointers that I keep for myself. Okay, so yeah, new, I'm sorry, in Java, when you say new, you allocate new dynamic data on the heap. In, in C, it's memory allocation. All right, um, I think we'll skip this. This is about heaps. If you want to read the slide later, go ahead. Um, I think if you've programmed in C, you know that Memory allocation gives you, and when you're done with it, you need to free it up with a free command, but Java does automatic garbage collection. So with Java, when you say new, it gives you some more, but you don't have to say, now take it back. Whereas in C, if you say, now take it back, you take it back. And if you forget to, you don't take it back, and it just stays allocated, and it doesn't have automatic garbage collection. But in Java, since the later language, it was realized, huh, programmers forget to deallocate what they've allocated, and then the heap just keeps growing and never shrinks. We better have automatic garbage collection. So when you leave a programming environment, even if you didn't ask for it, uh, this happens automatically in Java. Okay, how Baron Olson. All right. Now, back to the low-level, really detailed stuff that you do need to know for uh, MIPS programming. Using registers to implement procedures. Hmm, sounds like what we've already talked about. Yeah, this is the cult principle of take -ra -la, take -ra -la, take -ra -la, to make sure that, you know, when you have a hammer and a nail, you hit it once, it usually doesn't go all the way in. I am pounding this nail till it gets in really deep and really solid because I want you guys to be able to program 
You're going to write assembly language programs on the first project, on some of the homeworks, on the midterm exam, on the final exam. You've got to be able to program in assembly language and soon, not by the end of the term, but you know, right away. Program in assembly language, I told you I can barely understand it. Well, that's why I keep pounding on the nail so that people get comfortable with the syntax and the meaning of these statements in this simple language. I mean, my goodness, it's low level. It's not very hard stuff. It's not, you know, like kafa al maz gibi So let's, let's, try to, let's try to get it. The caller has some registers that if he wants to protect them, he must save them because there's no guarantee the callee will. So if you have some precious value in A0 to A3 and you want to still have it after the call is returned from, you save. If you have some precious value in any of the temporaries and you want to still have it there after the call is returned from, you save. Okay? So those are called caller saved. Then you load your arguments into the argument registers. You put the rest of them, if there's more, on the stack above the frame pointer. And then you do the JAL. So that's called you know, more than four registers or spilling to stack. Then you do the JAL. Great. So the caller did that. Now the callee has been called. The, the transfer of control has come to the called procedure. We're calling it callee here. Caller, callee. What does the callee have to do? It needs to set up in memory a new frame. That means change the stack pointer from its old value to a new value. And it needs to change the frame pointer from its old value to its new value. And it needs to save anything that it's going to use, like S0 through S7, frame pointer, you know, return address, anything precious, or anything that's, that's fragile, it's got to save it. That save, of course, means push it on the stack. All right, so now it's, it's all set up. We've got a new frame. We've moved the stack pointer, moved the frame pointer, saved everything important. Now what do we do as the callee? You do what you're supposed to do. You do the actual function you're supposed to do. Now it's time for the callee to return. It's set up correctly. It executed what it needs to do. Now it's time to return. How does it return? You place the return values in V0 or V1, and if that's not enough, you do the same thing here. You put the rest on the stack, okay? Then you restore any callee saved, that's things you saved, you restore, off the stack and put them back like frame pointer, RA, and the S registers. Now you pop the stack by changing the stack pointer back to its original value, and then you return. So what have you done? You've cleaned up your house so that it's just like it was when you were called, except for the values that you're returning in the V0, V1, and maybe extras on the stack. Got it? Okay, that's the deal. That's the deal. You've got to do those things if you're calling. You've got to do those things if you're called. And you have to do some work in the middle. Otherwise, nobody will call you. If you say, yeah, I don't do any work. You can call me, but I'll just you know, save your stuff and put it back and come back to you. Yeah, why should I call you? Okay. All right. That's, any questions about that? That's a really good slide to give you the framework of what you have to do when you're programming procedures in assembly language. Or we could change it, what compilers have to do when they are compiling procedures in assembly language. Same thing. We're going to do it by hand. After this course, you're going to say, oh, I'm so glad there's compilers. I don't have to do that by hand anymore, OK? But for now, we're going to learn how to do it ourselves. All right, so here we go. Here's how to take an old stack frame and first changing the stack pointer and putting new things on and then changing the frame pointer. Now we have a new stack frame. The old one's still there and the new one is on top of it. Everybody see what happened here? First change the stack pointer. You know how much new stuff you're going to put on. Put it in, like the RA, the old frame pointer, the S registers. Now bring the frame pointer down too. So great. Now we've got the new frame and we've got pointed the beginning and the end of it and the data's in it. And now if you want to add any local variables, you just push them on and the stack pointer continues to move. Okay? So at the start, it looks like this. Then as you execute, you may add some more. You may decide to have a local data structure or anything and, you know, it, it'll grow down. But in the end, you want to come back to that picture. Because when you're done, you're out of there. It has to return the stack to the same uh, situation as it was in before. Any questions about this? You guys are either good or you've gone to sleep because uh, there were some questions earlier, some confusion, but I heard those 90, 95 percent, so it means everybody's got everything, right? Oh, ha, we're all good. Is anybody feeling a little bit kopmush? Anybody feeling a little scared by this? Not too sure what's going on? 
Okay, I hope so. I mean, I hope not. All right. Now compiling recursive uh, procedures. Okay, this is fact again. A recursive procedure that calls itself does something like this. Fact of zero needs to give one. Fact of one is one times one. Fact, you know, we know all that. And so we're going to assume that n is passed in the a0 and the result is in the v0. We've seen it, so we know what to expect. Oh, surprise, it's the same code again. All right, we'll just skip it because we've already taught it once. Uh, this shows the situation on the stack. So there's the old top of stack. The first time we call factorial with two, uh, the value gets pushed on and the return address gets pushed on because, remember, it's going to make a new call. And so the stack pointer came down from there to there. We added a, you want to call it a new frame, okay? All right, and then some other values are shown here as well. Actually, what this is, it's a walk through the execution of fact of two, which figures out what it is by calling fact of one, which figures out what it is by calling fact of zero, which knows what it is and returns that value, and then fact of one can calculate and know what it is and return, and fact of two can calculate and know what it is. So we should expect to see this go from that to that to that, and then come back, come back, come back. And in the end, we'll be done, and the final value of factorial of two will be uh, in the V0 register. So that's, in fact, what is going to happen, okay? Well, there's the second call, there's the third call. Notice values down here are changing. But now we've got A0 is 2, A0 is 1, A0 is 0. So this is from the call of fact of 0, this is from the call of fact of 1, this is from the call of fact of 2. Goes on the stack. And notice all that really goes on is a return address and the value of A0. Remember, because we said push 2. All right, so what we did was we called and it called itself, which called itself. We haven't had any returns yet. Now we're going to have a return. Fact of zero is the default case, the base case. And we know what that is. It's one. So we're going to get a return value of one, which we got here. And then that's going to put us in the situation uh, where we multiply that by one times one. And we get, and notice what, oh, sorry. Notice what happened to stack pointer. Stack pointer goes up. Oops, it should, that slide is wrong. It should be here. Next slide. Yeah, I'm not sure. Anyway, it goes back up and eventually goes back up. I can't promise the animation works correctly. In the end, here's our situation. 2 times 1 times 1. So fact of 2 is equal to 2. All right, we've got about 10 minutes left. I'm going to go into character data now, unless you have uh, intense questions about procedure calls. Okay, we started with JAL and JR to get into and out. Then we defined what a leaf procedure is and showed that it has to save certain things. Then we went to non-leaf procedure, which calls something else, and we showed that it has to save certain things plus some other things. Then we showed how that actually looks as you add stack frames or activation records onto your stack. And we showed how nested procedures work together. And then two different times we looked at nested procedures which are calling themselves. That has a special name. It's called recursion. Okay, but what I taught you isn't recursive programming. What I taught you is nested procedure calls. The A can call B, can call C, or fact can call fact, can call fact. That's not very different. It's not important about that. All right. So that's the review of what we did. We did a lot of that today. I hope it feels reasonably comfortable. If it doesn't, you know where to go look. Book, TAs, Hoja, email, web, lots of resources available for this. Yeah? Uh, do we don't talk no, no, no. Thre threaded programming will be taught in uh, the operating systems course and more in the network course, but not in this course. This is not a course in threaded programming. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I'm wondering about how uh, field recursion works in uh, something. I think there's actually a tail recursion example in the textbook, as I recall. So. Read the book. <laughs> okay. In the interest of time, I'm going to move to the next section, which is 2.9 about character data. So we're on page 122 in your textbook, if you have it. Okay. Um, Byte encoded in character sets mean that every character is encoded with one byte, maximum of eight bits. Uh, if you do that, 
uh, in 7-bit ASCII, you have 128 characters, and that's 95 graphic and 33 control. ASCII is a very famous character set. stands for American Standard for Char Computer Information Exchange. The only trouble is that the A stands for American. So guess what? If your language isn't North American English, uh, your character set might not fit. And, and a storm of you know, troubles came from having ASCII as the standard computer information exchange language as soon as Spanish with its tildes and Turkish with its, you know, noctulas and noctuses and German with its umlaufs and, you know, all kinds of languages with their shapkas. Those are just Latin character sets. Now let's talk about Arabic character sets or Cyrillic character sets or East Asian. They don't work with ASCII. So it's not a very global system. The A stands for American. They jumped on first, it started being used, and we had to live with it for a very long time. But one of its problems is there's only seven bits or at most eight bits. So it works great for Latin character sets and not very good for everything else. So Unicode, as you know, uh, was a standard that came along around the same time Java did. So Java decided to go big uh, into Unicode and C which uses ASCII, even uh, decided to go with Unicode and C++. Most of the world's alphabets and all the symbols are available because if you have 32 bits, you have 4 billion characters, and that's enough to handle all the planet Earths. And you can also have subsets of it, an 8-bit Unicode and a 16-bit Unicode can keep the size of the characters much smaller. So those are some ways to code characters. Now, Byte and half word operations. That means that we don't need all 32 bits. We need half of it or even one fourth of it. So if I want to deal with a byte or a half word in MIPS, I need to be able to load and store bytes and load and store half words. And so load byte, destination register address, load half word destination register address become valid commands. And what happens is, of course, uh, that the value you're taking from memory, here it's an 8-bit value, and here it's a 16-bit value, gets sign extended into 32 bits, and then you put it into the register. In other words, this is a 32-bit destination. This is an 8-bit source. This is a 32-bit destination. This is a 16-bit source. I can't do it. What would I do with the extra bits? I have to make it a 32-bit uh, item. So this is sign extended to 32, this is sign extended to 32. Now, load byte unsigned says don't sign extend it, please zero extend it. It's not a number, I don't care about keeping the sign bit, so this simply zero extends this by adding 24 zeros, or zero extends this by adding 16 more zeros, okay, in order to form a word and then load it into RT or RT. So those are the half word unsigned and the load byte unsigned are just corresponding to those. And then, of course, there's the store. But in this case, you're taking a smaller number of bytes out of a, or bits out of a register and putting it in memory. When you store a byte, you look at a 32-bit register, you take the 8-bit byte you want, and you store it into one memory location. When you do store a half word, you look at the register, you take 16 of its bits and store it into two memory locations, because memory locations, of course, are bytes. So this will store into this memory location, and this one will store into this memory location and the next one, the two successive bytes. So obviously store word takes the full 32 bits and stores into four memory locations, the first one you gave and the next one and the next one and the next one. Are we clear on that? So we match. Things that are byte wide get stored in a byte. Things that are half word wide get stored in a half word. Things that are a half word wide gets stored into a 32-bit register, but we had to extend it here and there, or we had to extend 8 bits here and there. Okay, so we can do operations. So therefore, which of these would be useful for ASCII characters? Which of these would be useful for ASCII characters? Right? Bytes. ASCII characters are bytes. Which ones would be useful for Unicode? Answer is which Unicode? This one, the byte operations. This one, the half word operations. This one, the word operations, right? Pen Unicode's got different sizes. Okay. Um, let's look at a string copy program in C. This is a rather naive program. What does naive mean? Exactly, yeah. It's not very smart, okay? Kind of uh, Gary Zekela. Uh, <laughs> 
All right. In C, strings are terminated by a character called the null character. The null character's ASCII code is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so the null character tells you I've come to the end of the string. You don't put nulls in the middle of strings because the first null says that's the end of the string. So nulls are only used uh, at the end of the string. So here's a program called string copy. And what it does, it takes a character array Y and a character array X, and it says starting with integer I equals 0, as long as these two are equal and, and not, no, I'm sorry, that doesn't mean that. That means copy this over to that, and as long as it was not equal to the null character, add one to I and keep doing it again. So it stops doing this when you meet this condition. Otherwise, it keeps on doing it. So that's what we want. It says take the character copy it from the Y position into the X corresponding position. If it wasn't zero, do, the net, do it again. If it was zero, that's your last one, because that was the null. Everybody agree that that does string copying from one byte array to another byte array? And it, and it assumes, as C does, that it terminates with the null character, okay? And so now, in order to do this in assembly, what do we need to know? We need to know the address of the beginning of the X array, the address of the beginning of the Y array, and the location that you want to put the temporary I value in. So we're going to use S0 for that. We'll use A0 and A1 for that. So we're going to call this with two parameters. Those would be good choices for the parameters. But notice we're not passing the whole array. What are we passing? Pointer to the beginning of the array. We're passing a pointer, passing an address. Okay, so here it goes. Here's the MIPS code. String copy says, make room on the stack to do what? Push something on. Make room on the stack to push something on. What are we going to push? What are we pushing onto the stack? S0. Why? Because we're obviously going to use it and change it, right? And we, and we have to yet return with it unchanged. So we're going to push S0 on the stack. That's why that. Better find that we fix it at the end. OK, that's good. We bring it back off and we adjust the stack back. Whatever you do in the beginning with pushing, you got to undo at the end with popping. And that's at the end right before we return. OK, what's the actual work here? The actual work here is put 0 into S0. So that lets i equal to 0, the initialization value. And then here's a loop. Everybody can see here we're going to j to L1. So you initialize outside the loop. Here's the body of the loop. Notice that it's a middle tested instead of bottom tested loop. So we have both a branch and a jump. Therefore, it's inefficient. We don't write our code like this. Please don't do that in your own codes. OK, and what do we do? We first, in the loop, take our value of A1, which was the Y array's base address, and add to it the value of S0 right now in order to point to a particular byte. And we put that value in T1, and we use that as an address, and go get that byte and bring it in unsigned, which means we extend it with zeros into register T2. So what did we just do? What's in T2 right now? The ith byte value of array Y. The ith byte value of array Y. What do we do with the thing that we have in T2? Well, we don't do anything with it until we do this. We take the base address of the X array, Add also S0 to it and put that in T3. Just the same as this, but we used A0 instead. So now in T3 is the base address of the X array. And then what do we do? We store the byte, which we got out of the Y array, into that location in the X array. That's our copy of the byte. Okay. Now that we've done that, we say, was it the last byte in the string? How do I test that? How do I know if it was the last byte in the string? was it equal to the value of null, which is 0. So I'm going to test and see, was the value of that T, uh, T2 register equal to 0? If it was, that was my null character, and I'm done copying the string. I jump to L2, or branch to L2, which means finish up, you're done. But if it wasn't, then what do I do? Increment my I value, which is my loop counter, and go back to the top of the loop and do it again. Did everybody read that code? and understand that code. I talked in English. That's talking in MIPS assembly language. I hope you can understand both languages. OK. Any questions about that assembly code? All right. So there's 
string copying in C as compiled into MIPS. And that's all we have time for today. Thanks for coming. See you.